Good to see you tonight and welcome to Wednesday night here at Riverbend. Uh, just three quick announcements. Next Wednesday night, there's going to be a seminar. It's a biblical financial planning seminar. It's entitled Leaving a Lasting Legacy. And it'll be over here in room 185. And it'll be at 5 o'clock. Uh, be led by Pastor Brian Giaquinto. It's free. But what we'll encourage you to do, if you come earlier, you can get your food. And then you can eat during the seminar there in 185. Uh, if you could let us know you're coming, though, we'll make sure we have a room that's big enough with enough chairs. And so you can just call the church office, make that reservation. Second, this Saturday is Family Day at Warm at Vince Carter uh, Sanctuary in Bunnell. And as you know, Warm is a, a ministry that Riverbend's been uh, very involved in for many years now. It's to women in rehab that have gone through addiction and it's an incredible ministry. So there's gonna be a day of fun uh, for their families, for the kids. And uh, if you just wanna stop by and see kind of what's happening there, meet some of the ladies, you are invited. The volunteers are all set, they're ready to go with it. Uh, but it'll be 11 o'clock to two o'clock and there'll be uh, food and crafts and games and inflatables and just a lot of fun. And it'll be a good opportunity maybe to uh, to meet uh, some of these uh, families. And then thirdly, um, if you have not found your place of ministry here at Riverbend, uh, let me encourage you to really seek the Lord in that because we all want to be actively involved in, in ministries here. And it could be that the one that the Lord would have you do is worship choir. And we'll be rehearsing right after church tonight in the choir room. And if you have any interest in that, we'd love to see you um, come and be a part of that ministry. So our scripture reading tonight is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 29. And as you know, the Lord uh, laid it on David's heart to build a temple. And uh, he gathered all the materials. The Lord gave him the plans. And as he was nearing the end of his life, he turned all of that over to his son Solomon who would actually build the temple. And then he called on all the people to bring offerings um, to, um, to help build the temple. And they responded tremendously. And this was all right before David's death. But then David stood before all the people and he prayed this prayer taken from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And I believe this is a prayer that we can amen in our own hearts tonight, even as David did um, aloud. He said this, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted above all. Both riches and honor come of you, and you reign over all. And in your hand is power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather tonight. Father, we, pr we pray for every uh, person here tonight, for every family in our church. Father, we pray that you would raise up husbands here at Riverbend that love Christ and that love their wives uh, as Christ loved the church, that are loving spiritual leaders in their home. And Father, we also pray for the wives. We pray that they might love Christ and love their families. Father, we pray for youth, that they might be saved young and they would be passionate in serving the Lord, standing against the world and its ways. Father, we pray for children, uh, children that would obey their parents and learn the things of the Lord. And Father, we pray for their, their salvation as well. We, we pray for singles, that they might passionately love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and they, they would be much different than the world. Father, we pray that as a result of being here tonight, that we might be more passionate worshipers, that we might love Christ more, that we might be more and more transformed into the image of Christ as we're being sanctified. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. What a, what a great thing it is to think about that and how we should pray for uh, each other in the church family. So church, it's good to see you this morning. Why don't you stand tonight as we just worship the Lord together. Man. 
timeless truth. seated. Wonderful, timeless truths, as Hayward said. What a beautiful set of songs to sing to our Lord tonight. Good to see each and every one of you out here. What a blessing to gather in the midweek, get in the Word, get strengthened, encouraged. It's good to see people out. Some people are coming back from all kinds of things. It's Mike Waters, my buddy's back there. Look at him. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to gather. And we're still in this free country, Lord. We still can come without reservation, Lord. We thank you for that. We do thank you that we have an even greater freedom, though. We're free because of your grace. We just sang that. We... We're no longer bound and 
slavery to our sins. We no longer suffer the eternal consequences that would come with that, the awaiting fires of hell. You have freed us from our sin through your grace. And what a blessing it is to know that, to sing about it, to teach on it, to live by it, to rehearse it daily. These are all good things, Lord. Lord, we thank you for those that are gathered tonight. Be with those who wanted to be here, but from some circumstances that have prevented them. We pray that they would have time with you, Lord. Now, Lord, as we teach your word, may our hearts be strengthened. May you be worshipped. In Jesus' name, amen. Numbers chapter 4 is our passage. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I trust you have your Bibles with you. It's always good to bring a Bible with you. Um, electronic or paper will do. Sunday, excuse me, Saturday afternoon, I'm usually in here in the mornings and then kind of work through the day finishing up uh, Sunday sermon. And um, I had uh, noticed that our chair ministry had not showed up. And um, so I poked my head in here and there was no chairs. And I thought, hmm, I don't think I can do this. (laughs) Soon after that, Duke came walking through the door. And if you know Duke, he is our leader of our chair ministry. It's a very small group, needs to grow. And Duke came in, and he began to lay out the cords and teach me how that. Well, I can hang around for a few minutes till some of the other guys show up and, and help him for a little bit. And it was pretty amazing just the structure that they have down to set up 700-plus chairs in this room for, for Sunday morning. It's pretty fascinating if you've not seen it. Um, and I, I began to think I was setting up this section over here, and people were moving some chairs around, and they, they told me what to do and came and checked my work several times. And... Uh, <laughs> which needed to be checked. Um, And I thought, what would we do if we didn't have any chairs on Sunday morning? I think, you know, guys would probably jump in and, you know, we would get it done. Um, But would some people leave? (laughs) I'm not sitting on the floor. Um, You know, and how did that chair get there that you're sitting in? You know, so I'm setting chairs up thinking about that. I thought, well, Lord, this is just right up the alley of uh, Numbers chapter 4 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. God has a working, functioning body that is many, they're one body, but many parts to do things. And I just marveled at it, and I just thank the Lord for Duke and Rick and Eli, and uh, Aaron had stopped by and was helping out. They called Landon because it was just a change in time, and the, some of the team members couldn't make it. And these, these guys showed up, and they joyfully served in a way that probably nobody thought about on Sunday morning as you sat your little tail end down in that chair. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, that's, that's ministry. Meanwhile, down the hall was foot care going on that morning. And some of our dear young sisters in the Lord are running that ministry. And they're down there just caring for souls of their feet and their souls too. Uh, and I just, you know, the whole morning and, and just studying and getting ready to preach that sermon last Sunday was just encouraging to see the body function. And so when we say, oh, please get involved in a ministry, we want you to see this more than just some elders pleading with you. <laughs> it is the functioning of God's people. Doing things that most people will often not see. Well, just a touch of 1 Corinthians 12 to come. Verse 23 says this. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable. I don't know. Maybe that's chair ministry. or Foot washers or baby holders or those who clean, those who cook. On these we bestow more honor, abundant honor. The Bible says. On our lesser presentable members become much more presentable. And so uh, the Bible is reminding us that we must honor those that we don't see. And I was greatly encouraged. And then I came to this passage this week and opened my Bible on Monday and started working on Numbers chapter 4. And I became overwhelmed with God's desire to use his people to do in some ways seems like meaningless tasks to bring him glory. 
And this passage really struck me in a lot of ways. I have three thoughts here. One, just we're going to work our way down through this text. Again, a lot of division and numbers and things like that. And then really two points of application that I want to draw out from this. So first, we see a division of labor in the presence of the Lord. Remember, we're dealing with a tabernacle here. They're handling the Lord's earthly dwelling place. It's called the Holy of Holies for a reason. And so in this passage is all this instruction given to Moses and Aaron and then down to the different families of the Levitical tribe of how this temple was to be handled. It is God's earthly dwelling place at this time. It's fascinating. And look, you can't help but think in the New Covenant way that the Bible says that we are his temple. And and you can't study this passage and start not think, oh God, we're the temple of God. How do you want us to handle the temple, right? We saw that in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, where it said, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Remember this, the cloud, right? It's the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. It is the Spirit of God directing this nation. It's hovering over this tabernacle. They know God is there. And then when we move to the new covenant, you begin to go, oh my goodness, I'm that tabernacle now. (laughs) He's tabernacling in me. Paul goes on to say, You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. So as I go through this, I really want you to make that connection. It's it's amazing how God landed me in Numbers 4 and 1 Corinthians 12. I mean, they mirror each other in so many ways. And you're going to hear some of this on Sunday, too, because you just can't help but do it. We'll look at Numbers 4. Here we see this chapter about the division of labor in the Levitical tribe, particularly... now. Think about this, when it comes to moving the tabernacle and how God's dwelling place is to be handled. Uh, Verses 1 through 20, you'll see the instructions of the Korathites, uh, what they're going to do. Verses 21 through 26, you see the Gershonites, what they have to do. And then 29 through 49, you have the Merites um, and their roles of what they have to do. But notice in verse 1 um, that the Lord is speaking to both Moses and Aaron here. He speaks to both of them. And he he calls them here to take another census. He took another census in chapter 3 to know how many were in each of these family groups of the Levitical tribe. But now he's calling for another census. This is God doing this. He has the right to count his people, doesn't he? And so he takes a census here. But it's interesting. I just want to highlight. He's speaking both to Moses and to Aaron. Moses is the mediator, right? He is... He is the, the one, the go-between, the, na- the nation and their God. And certainly he represents Christ in a type, doesn't he? And then you have Aaron, who is the high priest, who is to come into the presence. Only him and him alone can come into the presence once a year to God and offer the sacrifice for the nation. And so he is the high priest, and certainly he is a type of a greater high priest that's to come, the Lord Jesus Christ, who had to die for Aaron, the high priest of sins. But they're both there, and God's speaking to them. Now, you'll recall that a total count of each family members of the Levites was done in chapter 3. And then there was this ransom gift for extra children, most likely that were born probably since they left Egypt there. But the Lord had separated this tribe of Levi um, in in a family group's And their goal, what God had for them, the goal was for them to stand before him and minister to him and minister to the people and uh, be able to bring them into this reconciling relationship. It was temporary till Jesus came, but that was their role. Now, because of this, the tribe of Levi had no portion, no inheritance. The Bible says God was their inheritance, and that's quite a thought, isn't it? I imagine some of the Levites said, well, great, God, is glad you're on my hair. It's sure nice to be a, have a piece of land. <laughs> uh, they were not given anything. Um, although they, they were blessed with meals, they ate of that food. We'll see next week where God separates out 
um, those who have deformities and stuff. And we'll, we'll get into that and try to understand what, why God's doing that. But those two were taken care of in the priestly tribes. Um, but God took care of them. But their inheritance was the Lord. And I, and I think as people who know the Lord, um, you, you, maybe you don't have a lot of inheritance coming. We were with my dad a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago when we were back out there. And, you know, trying, he was trying, well, what gun do you want, son? And I said, well, you know what gun I want. <laughs> and that's all he has. He doesn't have anything. My no, father and mother passed away. They don't have much to give to us. But I have the Lord. And we have the Lord. And, and Christians have the Lord, right? The priesthood of believers have the Lord. And there's, there's nothing greater than that. You can take the world's greatest things. You can take the world's riches. You can have them because we have the Lord. And yet God is gracious to us, isn't he? Now, in chapter 4, there's this, again, this extra census taken. But this time, it's, of, uh, it's to ma- number the males in each of these family groups between the ages of 30 and 50. And the ages of, of the Levites change from time to time. If you're studying Chronicles, it drops down to 25. And it, it, I think it has a lot to do with different things they're doing. But particularly in this role, in the disassembling and the reassembling and the transport, transportation of the tabernacle, the age is fixed 30 through 50. Notice you see that in verse 3. 30 years and upward, even 50 to 50 years old, all who the, uh, enter the service to do the work in the tent of the meet, tent of meetings. If you drop down to, that's the Korathites. Then if you drop down to 23, he says the same thing. From 30 years and upwards to 50 years old, you shall number them, all who enter and perform the service to do the work of the tent of meetings. That's um, certainly the Gershonites. And then the Marriottes, uh, verse 30, um, from 30 years upward, even to 50 years, you shall number them. Every one of them should enter the service to do the work in the tent of meetings. And so, it is separating these out. And it's just interesting. I mean, I got thinking just a little bit about 30 to 50. Um, that's, that's quite a, that's probably a, a pretty prime time, isn't it? They're, they're old enough to exercise proven wisdom, right? You may be late teens or 20s men, and we probably still did some pretty dumb things. <laughs> 30, you may have a family, and you're responsible, and you're thinking a little differently. There's uh, a level of proven and exercised wisdom at this age. You're old enough to have developed the control of your strength. I remember getting older and playing, still playing some ball and playing with the young guys. And they were so much faster and so much quicker and do all kinds of... But I was smarter. <laughs> and I could control my strength a little bit. And you could still outmaneuver those guys because they just hadn't reined in all that strength they had, right? As you get a little older, you, a little older, you start to rein that in. I think it also, they were old enough to learn submission. Sometimes men never grow up and learn this, but the priesthood needed to. There was an orderly structure with oversight of Aaron and his, and his sons, and it had to be done God's way. You'll see in this text, or you die. And so it had to be men who were proven character, uh, uh, proven that they could submit and do as God instructed, and those that were over them, and they would reap the benefits from that. I think they're old enough to understand the value of collective work as well and teamwork. As we'll see, this is, a, this is quite an organization of people, two to three million people, and then there's this one tribe within them that has the oversight of the tabernacle and it has to come down and when that pillar moves they move and everything in that in that tabernacle has to be protected from the sight of anybody other than Aaron and his sons and so this takes tremendous teamwork and i think this age shows that also i think there's a life expectancy that may not have been as long during the ancient world uh josephus marks that by the time of christ the Male age was down to about 42. Um, I think Christ changed that life expectancy while he was on the earth, at least in his area. But look at verse 4 with me. It says, This is the work of the descendants of Korath in the meaning, ten of meanings concerning the most holy things. Well, here begins to show this clear instruction to the descendants of Korath here that, that what they were to do, right, pertaining to this ten of meanings and 
and its most holy things and furniture. So uh, we, we, we start with these guys, this group here. Verse 5, when the camp set out, Aaron and his son shall go in and they shall take down the veil and the screens and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Well, this is a real key verse because it explains here that Aaron and his sons were the only ones to even see the holy furniture. In fact, I'm not sure if they're studying this, they even looked at it. And I would probably argue they didn't. Aaron and sons were to cover in a way and wrap everything before the Korathites were ever there. Before they came on the scene, Aaron and his sons would start to wrap the ark and the rest of the furnishing that were in that, and they would, they would come at it in a certain way and they able to not look upon it and die. Notice verses 6 through 14. And they shall lay the covering of porpoise skins on it and shall spread, out, spread it over the cloth of blue, pure blue, and shall insert the poles. And over the table of bread of, it, of the presence, they shall also spread the cloth of blue and put it Put in on, uh, excuse me, put on it the dishes and the pans and the sacrificial bowls and the jars of the drink offering and the continual bread shall be on it. And they shall spread over them a cloth of scarlet material and cover the same with a covering of porpoise skins and they shall insert its poles. Then they shall take the blue cloth and cover the lamp stand for the light along with the lamps and the snuffers and the trays and all its oil vessels by which they serve it. And they shall put it and all the utensils in a covering of porpoise skins and shall put it on the carrying bars. Over the golden altar they shall spread the blue cloth and cover it with a covering of porpoise skins and shall insert its poles. And they shall take all the utensils of the service with which they serve in the sanctuary and put them in a blue cloth and cover them with a covering of porpoise skins and put them on carrying poles. And they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth over it. And they shall also put all of its utensils by which they serve in connection with it, the fire pans, the forks, the shovels, the basins, the, all the utensils of the altar, and they shall spread a cover of purple skin over it and insert the poles. Well, here it gives you a very clear detail as you can see this work happening. They don't look at the furniture. Aaron and his sons move forward, cover that furniture, put all the implements in with them, and then in comes the Korathites, and they are the ones to transport that. But notice in verse 50, 15, I think there's a key verse here. When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy objects, here's, here's where we start to understand why Aaron and his sons were set apart. And all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is to set out, after that, a real key little phrase there, after that, the sons of Korah should come to carry them. So that, look at this, they will not touch the holy objects and die. These are the things in the tent of meaning which the sons of Korah are to carry. We all know our minds go to that scene where they're bringing the ark back after it has been returned from the Philistines and then kept in a house um, for a while, and great blessing happened there. And, of course, David and his men go to bring it back, and they cross a brook, and it starts to wiggle, and uh, a priest puts his hand out, he says, the name went out of my head, um, to try to steady that, and immediately he dies. God was serious about his holiness, and so much when we study in the Pentateuch, you, you have to see the emphasis of God's holiness. How we approach him and who he is and how set apart he is. And then it leads you to this temporary sacrificial system to help you understand the great work that Christ had to do to bring us into his presence so we can speak speak at any time with him, right? And certainly at death can go immediately to be absent from those bodies, to be present with the Lord, to go immediate with him all because of the finished work of Christ. So Christ comes and grants us a position through his finished work, declares us holy and blameless so we can be in his presence. And you just can't miss that when you study these passages. People who don't know Christ, don't don't understand his beauty, don't understand his finished work and his glorious person. They read the Old Testament and they just, it seems so foreign to them. Who is this God that can't be touched? So they don't see themselves as sinners and 
what has to be done with our sin in order for us to come into his presence. And every time I study this, it just reminds me how glorious our Savior is. But notice God was protecting them really from himself, verses 17 through 20. He says, then the, the Bible says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Do not let the tribe of the families of the Korathites be cut off from among the Levites. Do it my way so these guys don't die. <laughs> Isn't, nothing's changed with that, right? If you don't come to God, God's way, through Jesus Christ alone, you die eternally. That's not changed, has it? I mean, that's, that's a clear teaching. Jesus Christ came to give life and give it abundantly, right? He's the source of life. If you drink the water of this world, you're going you're gonna to thirst forever, right? If you drink my water, you'll be satisfied. I think that's pretty fascinating, isn't it? Verse 18, do not let the tribe of the families of the Christ be cut off from the Levites, but do this to them that they may live. I, I just think that's a fascinating statement. I think... We, in the New Covenant, look at this and go, teach people the gospel so they'll live. Teach them how to come to God, God's way. Don't, don't teach them to, well, come to church, everything will be great. You go to church all your life and go to hell without the salvation of Jesus Christ and his finished work, Right? And I just, I, I just gravitate it to that statement. But do this to them that they may live. Teach the truth. Teach how you come to God. Teach how you approach God. We do it through Jesus Christ alone. He is the mediator. He's, he's the substitute. He's the final lamb. He's the one that brings us into the presence of the Father. No one comes into his presence except through him. And live, right? Later we'll see in Numbers where the snakes are biting them because they're so rebellious. And they put a bronze serpent up that just represents sin. Christ, the sin bearer, is going to point towards. Look and live is the word, right? Look and live. How many people do you know people who just will not look to Jesus and live? And we know it's a sovereign thing. We know it's God that must do it. But our hearts break over it, don't we? And maybe this is part of the rebellion that comes later in chapter 16 with Korath because they just don't like it. It's not right. How come Aaron gets to touch these things? How come he gets to go over? How come he does all these things? They're, they're not happy with the way God laid things out. But God's clear here. Teach them to do this so they may live and not die when they approach the most holy object. There is going to come... <laughs> We know that there's a separation of the sheep and goats coming. And there's a whole lot of people who are going to come up and say, God, I did this and I did this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. I've done this and I've done this in your name. I've done all these things. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I think that's what happens with Korah. Korah raises up, right? And he brings this rebellion forward. God opens the earth and swallows them. I think it's a foreshadowing of things to come. I told you to come my way. You've rejected that. Now you go down. It's fascinating, isn't it? Verse, verse 19, the latter part says, Aaron and his son shall go in and assign each of them his work and to his load. But they shall not go in to see the holy objects even for a moment or they will die. This is, this is detail, brothers and sisters, of how to handle the things of God. It is it's not just whimsical. Has that happened in today's church? Are, are people flippant with God's word, with God's instruction, with what God tells us to how to approach him and how to live our lives? Are, are they flippant with it? Does it... Is it all centered around how they feel and what's being done to them? And what, is, that, is that where the American church is? It seems in some places. Verse 16. You notice, if I back up just a bit, you see that Eliezer, Eliezer the son of Aaron, he's the one of the sons that has left. The other sons did not do things God's way. God struck them dead, right? Nadab and Abihu. 
Now we're to Eliezer and Ithamar. But here Eliezer is given this role and he, he handles the oil and of the light, the fragrance, verse 16, the fragrant incense, the continual grain offering, the anointing oil, the responsibility of all the tabernacle and all that is in it with the sanctuary and its furnishing. So Eliezer is given care over this. And this is Aaron's son given great responsibility over these objects. We know this. This is repeated from chapter 3, verse 32. But it contains these oils and fragrances and all that. And all this was set apart for God. These were holy things. And, and they are set apart, but man, they are awful, extremely expensive as well, I think. Gene and I were talking yesterday. We were talking about myrrh and some of the oils that we see in the Bible. And uh, uh, we, I was driving and she was looking it up on Google and seeing where some of this comes from and why it's so expensive. Some of this stuff would only grow in certain regions and the work it took before we have you know, hydraulic presses and stuff now to extract these oils. Uh, the oil we saw in the book of Leviticus was the purest. The purest only was to come before God with, with no impurities that it did. The cleanest, the most expensive, the greatest was to go. And this is how we come to God. We don't come to God through some cheap, works-based, man-centered way. We come through the most richest, glorious way, and that's Jesus Christ. There's no, nothing more worth than Jesus in his blood and his sacrifice. It's the greatest thing we come in. And we've got to protect that, right? Because so many people are saying, oh, well, Jesus plus this and that. I'll send you right to hell. And so this is expensive here. I tied this to Ezekiel. I jumped over Ezekiel 22, 8 there. We're in the middle of a lot of judgment passages on the nation. And here God says, you have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. I told you. I told you how to come to me and how to handle my stuff. And you despised it. I mean, those are, those are powerful passages you get in the middle of Ezekiel, and you just see this judgment being poured out on the nation of Israel because they rejected God coming his way. Look at verses 21 through 28. We get to the Gershonites here. You'll notice in verses 25 through 27, we see what they're carrying. Again, they're, they're 30 to 50 year old. They're part of the census. The census. Um, they're serving and carrying, verse 24, and they carry the curtains of the tabernacle, the tent, meaning, tent of meetings, with the coverings and the coverings of corporate skins that is on the top and the screens for the doorway and the tent of meetings, the hanging of the court, the screens for the doorway, the gate of the court, which is around the tabernacle and the altar, and their cords and all the equipment for their service and all that is to be done, they shall perform all the service of the sons of the Gershonites in all their loads and all their work shall be performed at the command of Aaron and his sons and you shall assign to them as a duty over all their loads. Verse 28, you see that Ithamar is given as charge over that. You get to verses 29 through 33. Here you come to the Mariites. Um, they're the third family um, and they, as you notice in verse 31 and 32, they are in service to the tent of meetings. They carry the boards of the tabernacles, the bars, the pillars, the sockets, the pillars around the courts, the sockets, and their pegs and their cords with all their equipment, with all their service. And you shall assign each man by name the item to carry. Again, Ithamar is the son that's over them to make sure that gets done Right, um, it is said that they carried the most heaviest load. So these guys were, um, they were charged with a, a little bit of a more weightier load to care. Now, when you notice a division of labor among the Levites, um, I, I, I'm thinking about it in this verse and just put some thoughts in my notes. The Levites, they have a body of priesthood and they have division how to serve the Lord. And then you have a division of labor among Moses and Aaron's family. Remember, they're camped on the east side where the gate would go into the courtyard and then eventually go into the, most, the holy place and most holy place. They're of a family. And so God takes this priesthood, the Levites, 
and he divides it up within them uh, ways and, and instructions of how they're going to serve the Lord. Then he takes the leadership of the country and he divides up within them how they're going to serve the Lord. I thought, Lord, you, you do things so well. <laughs> we still do that today, right? If you sat in our elders meeting on Tuesday, you would see us working through our division of labor. There's nine of us. Um, we're, we all have oversight over different ministries and things that are going on and we try to let each other do our jobs and 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 it really have to because there's just so much going on in this ministry and as we work through guys are bringing people up to speed what's going on here getting counsel thinking about scripturally how we're going to handle these things it's really i mean so many times we come out of there yet there are times where your heart's heavy because there's hard things we have to deal with but there's many times you just come out and go man i love that Nine men working together in doing their part to serve the community. And then when you look at the priesthood of the brethren, right? Here's the priesthood. We're all part of that priesthood. Um, now we are the priesthood of, of God, right? According to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we're now the priesthood, the royal group of people called to his name who come into his presence and serve him. There's division all through and here of things to do, Right? And just glancing around the room, I see all kinds of men and women serving in all kinds of different ways in this church. And you do it for his glory, I hope. And I hope some of you are praying about what you're going to be doing. Because this is the way God sets up his people. He's always done this. He wants us part of what he's doing. And I think that is very encouraging. Well, verses 34 through 49 we start to see the census numbers being gathered and they're in these three family groups. And these numbers are important because they give us an understanding not only of just the sheer labor force to do this, that's important, but it also helps us understand how they were going to get this accomplished, right? Um, I don't know if it's some ancient Chinese proverb or whatever it says, many hands make light work. <laughs> well, I think this is true here. And that that old saying, I think, is something we all enjoy. It's the idea of when you have a difficult task and it's made easier when someone comes and helps you. You've all got the text that has the word moving in it. <laughs> and if you own a pickup, you're in trouble. And it's helpful if somebody comes along. If, I, we've been moving a lot this year. We're looking forward to the last move. Um, but you're going, man, I hate to ask people to help. But, but when they do, when people help you to do something, such as set up chairs or do something where there's a lot of work to it, man, does it get done quick when many hands are there. And I, and I see that in this. Notice in verses 35 through 37, you have the Korathites here. Now, chapter 3 told us there was 8,600 of them. But here, the number between age 30 and 50, there's 27, uh, 2,750 Men between the age of 30 and 50, that's a lot. And they carried the holy furnishings and all the, the utensils. They're all wrapped up and they're carrying them. And when you first read this, you go, man, if they're going 10 to 15 miles in a day, most humans could, a lot of times they traveled 20 miles. They set towns 20 miles apart because they could move in a day 20 miles. That, that's a pretty common number. Um, you think, I'm going to carry this thing for 20 miles? No, there's 2,750 of you to carry these things. And so you begin to realize there's, there's a whole force of men to take care of this. Verses 38 through 41, you come to the Gershonites here, and there's, chapter 3 tells us there's 7,500 of them, but between the ages of 50 and 30 and 50, there's 2,630 uh, 2, of them. And they're carrying all the curtains and coverings and screens. Um, and, and some theologians said that this was maybe the the lighter weight of stuff but it was bulkier and so it took men to carry this thing but there was a lot of them right and they could take turns and make sure that it was handled god's way when you get to verses 42 through 44 here you come to the mariites and and there the chapter 3 tells us that there's 6200 there and but between the ages of 30 and 50 there's there's 3200 guys and what I thought about this, and I go, I think this is the heaviest stuff, right? The boards, the bars, the pillars, the sockets, the pegs. I think it's the heaviest, and yet God gave them the most to do that. And then look at verses 45 through 49. The Bible says this, these are the numbers of the men of the sons of... Wait a minute, is that the right one? Mary, uh, 
Merari, whom Moses and Aaron numbered the commands of the Lord. 46 is what I want. And all, the, all the numbered men of Levites, whom Aaron, Moses and Aaron and the leaders of number, Israel numbered, by their families and by their father's household, from 30 years and upward, even to 50 years old, every one who could enter to do the work of the service and the work of carrying in the tent, tent of meetings, their number was 8,580. 8, and according to the commandment of the Lord, through Moses, they were numbered, every one by his service, or carry, and thus these were his numbers of the men, and they did it just as the Lord commanded. I think that's fascinating. It's, it, you know, from someone who likes logistics and, you know, some, some people like to get people all going in the same direction. Um, uh, there's just some fun to that sometimes. Um, it's really good to think about this, how many guys you could get all thinking together to get something accomplished. Because you want to do things God's way. And I thought, Lord, man, help us be a church, <laughs> a priesthood of believers who wants to do things God's way. Get us on the same page in every aspect because it's just amazing what can happen. Let me give you some, just some thoughts of application, two thoughts here because it's fun to think about some of this stuff. A division of labor following the Spirit of God. A division of labor, really say that's following the Spirit of God. I think it's helpful to kind of step back and look at the big picture here um, when you think about this. God has organized everything through Moses and Aaron and the nation, right? He's got this all organized. So all Moses has to do in the morning is he walks out of his tent, he recognizes whether that pillar is moving or not, and that signals everything. God's already given the instruction Everything's in place. And if that pillar of the cloud has lifted, it means it's time to go. If it doesn't, you stay. Pretty clear, right? And I think so much of scriptures, the majority of scriptures are very, very, very clear. <laughs> People just want to argue with them. Right? If the cloud was lifted, Moses and Aaron would simply had to watch to see the leading of the Spirit of God. They watch the Spirit of God lift up and move. And what a great example for us today. And yeah, we don't have a pillar of cloud and thank the Lord for that because they would worship the pillar, right? Um, the cloud. But we have the same Spirit of God, right? That, that's not a different Spirit of God than we have now. We have an immutable God who doesn't change, Right? And so we have the same Spirit of God. And so Romans tells us this, Romans 8, 4, 14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit, and I found that way, led, I started thinking, oh, that's Romans, Romans. Led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. See, these were the, the children of Israel. These were God's people. They were led by the cloud. They were led by the Spirit of God. And under the new covenant, all those who have the Spirit of God given to them through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, this identifying work of God, placing his spirit in them, these are the sons of God. And he leads us, think about this, he leads us through the spirit who always spotlights the word in Christ. So Galatians, Paul says in 5.16, but I say walk by the spirit, you're not carrying out the desires of the flesh. Jesus says, look, I'm going to give you the spirit of truth, and, he is, and, 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 and that is the word of truth, right? His word is truth, he says. And so the Spirit and the Word of God work hand in hand, and they never separate, even with man's experiences and all the things they want to talk about that they you know, did for him. The Spirit and the Word work tandemly together. And so as believers, we can still follow the Spirit of God just like they did then, because when the Spirit of God moves, we know it because we know the Word of God. Now, when Moses detected that the Spirit of God in the pillar of the cloud was lifted then all these working parts would start to happen, right? All these groups would start to go to work, and Aaron and his family immediately would head to the holy place there and to the uh, most holy of holies, and they would immediately begin to disassemble and carefully cover all of the furniture before the sons of Korah could get there and carry it. And, and I think they did that without even looking at it. They were told to do that, and the way they handled it, it was all detailed there, and I, and I believe that's a, a beautiful thing. 
Then these poles are put in. Notice as we read through that these poles are put in through the rings of the furniture. And then the Korathites would come in and they'd pick up those furniture things and they would carry it off to the designated area of travel. And once the Korath, Korah and Gershon and uh, Maria would be done and completed their work, they would wait to follow this cloud. And then think about the evening. I got to think about this. It was pretty fun. Wasn't that nice when that thing finally stopped? You remember hiking with your dad or your grandfather or someone like that, and they just keep going? And it's, you think you're never going to stop? <laughs> I remember being a little boy and trying to keep in my dad's footprints, you know. They were hard to step up. And finally, he would stop, he would get a rest. And I, I thought, I wonder if it was like that, you know. You got a couple million people moving through the desert, and all of a sudden, in the evening, this pillar of cloud stops in a certain camp spot. And that must have been thrilling. He's the, God stopped. And immediately everything goes into action. And all of the reverse that just took place, they reverse everything that just took place from the tearing down. Now they reverse it and all, the, all of the families start to do their work. And the ark is put down first, right? And it's covered. And everything's backwards. It all uncovers and backs up so no one can see it. All done to protect them from God and to do things his way. And then I thought about this. I said, they did this for 40 years. 40 years they did this. And there's times when we study, as we get a little further in, you'll see where they camp there for quite a while, but sometimes they're moving every day. Two million people. Up we go. Here we go. Everything you own, and the tabernacle is handled right. I read quite a bit of different guys on this, and from what I could see, most of them say that they could set that tabernacle up in about 30 minutes. They had it down. They could get it up and get it down quickly, done God's way. And there's just good questions here. Are we seeking the work of the Spirit, right? Charismatics try to steal the work of the Spirit, but we can't let them. Can't let them. The Spirit of God is equal to the Father and the Son. They share the glory together. He is a marvelous part of the Trinity, and we learn so much from Him. And we learn that he loves to spot the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, he, and he, he loves to spot that through the word of God. And he loves to identify believers. Mark us, seal us, guarantee our inheritance. He loves to do that. And we should never recognize that, right? You, you should recognize someone that the Spirit has marked. They love the word. They love Christ. They, they do that. And so we should know when he's moving. We need to be ready to go versus doing our own thing, Right? You pray for the will of God? Who you're going to marry? Who you're going to carry? We're going to go, job changes, moving. Spirit of God, show me through the word of God. Teach me what your will is for me. Do we do that? I think sometimes instead of asking God, we should, or telling God, we should ask him what he's doing and can we join him. Well, third and final point of application here. Is God is glorified in the days of small things. This was a fun one I got thinking about today. My dad loved to hunt and camp. I think he was the most happiest when we were camping or hunting. And he would lay everything out on the lawn and he would pack our vehicle so it was everything we could get in because we're going camping or hunting for two weeks. And he would train us boys what we had to do, right? Everything's on the lawn. Everything has to go in a certain way because it has to fit because there's a bunch of us. We were a big family. We all had to get in there with all our stuff. And then, of course, we had to bring animals home that we had harvested and all that. So he just had it down to a T. And so we would have dry out trial runs before we'd go. And all the camping equipment, everything out on the lawn. And, and of course, we'd put it in, take it out, put it in. He'd do all that. And then, then, then we'd get to the camp spot. And this was the most exciting if you're a boy, right? And dad, all the way there, okay, who, you got this, you got that, you got guys unloading, you got kids that are setting up, clearing the campsite and putting tents up and setting up the kitchen and gathering firewood and, and digging racks and uh, I'm building like racks for game stuff and digging latrines. And it's just all perfect harmony. And my dad's barking out orders over there, right? These four boys of his are moving to do that. It was fun. Those are great times. I taught my boys to do the same. Um, 
Gina camped with me in the dirt for a little while, but then she said, you know, I didn't get raised in your family. Buy me an RV. And so <laughs> she was happy from there on out. Uh, but it was still fun because we'd get there, and the boys, they didn't want to sleep in that RV. It was outside, and we'd get all everything going. And there was just great structure to that, and it was a lot of fun to see everything come together in a camp that was set up well, and you would sit down in your chair by the fire and just go, wow, we're going to enjoy these next two weeks with a nice camp. One author I was reading, he, which was much older, back when there was just trains that moved things around, he said his dad used to take him to the circus. And they, one of the things they loved to do is when the circus arrived in town, they would go out there. And he said, we watched them pull in. The cars would barely get stopped, and the men would pour off that. And they would have a big top up before you knew it. Um, and, he, and he gave an example just of the organization to get things done. But God loves small things, right? And so I drew my attention, and I got this all marked up in my Bible here, to verse 32. I want you to look at this. The Merarites um, had heavy loads, right? They had boards and bars in 31 and pillars and sockets. But in 32, they also had sockets and pegs. And I circled pegs. <laughs> And I got thinking about this today. What if you're the peg guy? <laughs> Just a seemingly meaningless job, right? I got the pegs. I don't even have a pillar. I'm just a peg. But what if that peg guy said, I'm tired of carrying this peg. I've been carrying this peg for 20 years. Pillar of cloud moves. Peg guy says, not doing it. Leaves the peg in the ground, kicks dirts off it, heads out. Tabernacle comes to a halt. The, the cloud halts and the tabernacle starts to go up and everything in its systematic order is being done. And all of a sudden in the southeast corner, the rope is stretched, but there is no peg. And the whole thing is not going to stay up, is it? So here comes Moses and Aaron and Eliezer and Ithamar. <laughs> Can you imagine that confrontation? Okay, peg guy, what'd you do with it? You had one job. Where's the peg? You know he would be on the ground holding a rope. They'd probably tie the rope to him and say, you stay here while we send some guy back 20 miles to go get your peg. <laughs> and you hold this down. So I think like the Old Testament, God has roles for us, and they're important. The body of Christ does not function if the pegs are not there. Brother and sister, you may be a peg. Be a good one. Let somebody drive you into the ground so you can hold the whole place down. I mean, think about that. There's such beauty and symmetry here to the imagery that God has given us. And it is God who's declaring the importance of every role here in the Old Testament. And it is God who claims and, and, and gives us the very perfect word of God to say there's not a lesser role. They're just different. And you, you can't help but study this and go, God desires our faithfulness. And, and let me go just a step further our faithfulness shows that we worship him. Right? Our faithfulness tells something, doesn't it? Our faithfulness also serves one another, right? That, that, that peg guy really put his group in a trouble, didn't he? I thought about that Saturday evening as I walked out of my office and there was nothing set up in here. I thought, uh oh, how's this going to work? But guess who showed up? The peg guys. <laughs> and they nailed it down. And it was amazing to watch them work and how they talked and they're encouraging each other. And guys are moving chairs and setting it up and they're checking my work and, and they're just doing what they're doing. And in the end, they cared for each other, high fived, and out the door they went. Because they were great pig guys. See, God wants 
the ark and all its furnishing carried in a certain way. But he also wants the tents and the pegs, as unglorious as they must may be, he wants them done his way, and it is extremely important, and it brings worship to him. And I'm pretty sure that God is not going to reward us for just sheer amount of work that we do, right? But he'll reward us because of our faithfulness for his glory. Because we're faithful to him because he saved us. And I don't know if God's calling you to carry a peg or the ark. I don't know. You, there's different jobs, right? There's different roles. But worship doesn't happen if we don't do it God's way. And we don't really, uh, I think, worship struggles when the body is dependent on 10% and not 90 or 100% of us doing it. That's a couple examples. Jesus um, has got the disciples. He's in Mark 12, and he takes them into the temple. And he points out a widow who came who had two small copper coins, and he uses her as this beautiful illustration. Now, I think he's showing the devastating false teaching of the Pharisees because this woman's given everything she has, she's going to maybe die because they, they poorly taught on those things. But at the same time, he points out, she, here she is giving something so small, so infinitesimal compared to the rich Pharisees and all the other people that are, that are pouring into the treasury and making all the noise with their money. Here she is doing something with two small copper coins. There was a short guy in the New Testament too. His name was Zacchaeus. Couldn't see around people, so he runs ahead and climbs up in a sycamore tree sees Jesus, and Christ calls him and draws him to him. And he, he's a small little guy and thinks he's a big fish in a small pond or whatever he, what his problem was. But when we go study him, you begin to realize he not only gives back all of the things he's cheated, but he gives back more. He actually does what we're going to see in chapter 5 um, uh, of, of giving back more. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14 tells us that the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there's few that find it. God did not create a wide berth to come to him. Ah, come through all those religions. Come through taking the table. Come, come to me, be saved through baptism. He didn't do all that. It's a very, very narrow gate. It is faith in Christ alone, through grace alone, isn't it? James says the tongue is really small, but it does, it boasts great things, right? Then there's this passage I want to go to, and I'll close with is Zechariah chapter 4. It's a verse I hear our elders and people around here quote quite often. And I got thinking about it, so I went and studied it a little bit today. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10 says this, For who has despised the day of small things? Here we have the vision, Zechariah's vision. In this one, particularly in chapter 4, there's the golden lampstand, there's the sovereignty of God, there's this priestly and kingly duty that boxes in the earth as it announced the coming of Messiah. It's just an amazing passage. It's the fifth of... It's the fifth vision here in the book of Zechariah, and it really is focusing here on a man named Zerubbabel. He's in the line of Christ. He's mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. He's a descendant of David. Zerubbabel is part of the rebuild of the temple. He's part of the group that has come back, um, and he's come back to the ruins of Jerusalem and the wall and the temple and and he's been given a role to rebuild this. And in this vision, he is encouraged to finish this temple, rebuild it as the nation invites God again to dwell with them. And this is clear because of the lampstand that's put into this vision. And, I, and, and I, I, what I think, the, what I believe the passage is teaching is this is all pointing towards the light of a coming Messiah. The light of the world is coming and this needs to be rebuilt and this needs to be a place of God. And this is why 
Jesus cleans it out several times. This is my father's house. And then during this rebuild of the temple, Zechariah and Joshua and Zerubbabel, these priests, um, they probably looked at this building that they were building and remembered Solomon's temple and said, oh, this is nothing like that. Solomon's temple, uh, Pastor Rick read the prayer of David after they'd gathered the things. And if you go on just a little farther past that, in uh, Chronicles, it's amazing, this temple he built. And doubtlessly, maybe they were discouraged. This isn't looking like what it was. And, and it's so easy to get caught up in outward appearances and be discouraged. And I, I think maybe these men were. And, and in this vision, they're reminded not to despise the things that are small. God is watching them. I think God wanted Zechariah and Joshua and Zerubbabel to know that he was watching over their work and he was pleased with it. And God knew that this was a foreshadowing of great things to come. It was the fulfillment of his son. And, 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 and they may have been tempted to think they were doing something small, but God wanted them not to despise this anointed work. Yes, it was a smaller scale, but realize the fullness of what it was picturing, what was coming. The light of the world was coming. The anointed one. And look, you may play a small role in the body of Christ, you think. But I think God's reminding all of us tonight that we've got to quit thinking small. God has an amazing role for us. I mean, from the, just the family aspect, husbands, wives, children, um, just the network of brothers and sisters caring for each other and praying for each other, meeting needs, feeding each other, uh, ministering to each other. It's just an incredible thing what God does. Talking to some people who are going through some difficult struggles, every one of them would say, I cannot believe how many people have reached out to us during this time. These are not small things. Jesus pointed out a lot of people that would have been thought of small. Luke chapter 4, when he's back in Nazareth and he's asked to read the scriptures, he does out of Isaiah talks about the fulfillment of himself, closes the book, hands it back, and he begins to talk about, in Elisha's day, there was a widow um, who was not Hebrew, who the Lord blessed. Then he talks about a leper, Naaman, who was not a Hebrew, who was blessed, and there was a slave girl. He, he, he brings up the highlight, and they get so mad because he brings up these nobodies in a lot of ways and says, look what God did for these nobodies. And they get so angry, they want to throw them off the cliff. Got thinking about that little boy in John chapter 6 with those little loaves of fishes, right? Loaves of bread and fishes. He gave them to the Lord. And the Lord took them and did amazing things, didn't he? John chapter 9, you got a blind man. This dude is nobody. And the disciples are caught up in, well, did he sin or did his parents sin? They can't get by that. That's what they were taught. Jesus says, neither he nor his parents, this was done for the glory of God. Then you read that and you go, God, you give me ailments, you give me difficulties to glorify you. It's worth thinking about, isn't it? The Canaanite woman, she's a Canaanite. They were to be stamped out, and they didn't do it. And Israel didn't do it, so Canaanites were still around. But God deals with a Canaanite woman who comes and says, even the dogs eat the crumbs. <laughs> and the Lord says, your daughter's healed. They're just nobodies, right? Time doesn't give me time to speak about Mary Magdalene, <laughs> the bleeding woman, the Roman centurion. And just think about those misfit disciples. Most of them probably uneducated fishermen. And God takes them and he spreads the gospel around the world through their message. It's fascinating, isn't it? Do things God's way, we will watch them work. Father, thank you for this message tonight. I didn't know there was that much there when I got into Numbers 4. It was just a joy to see how you clearly articulate how you want to be approached, how you want to be handled, how you want your things to be touched or not touched or seen or not seen. Lord, you clearly 
have one way to come to you. And Lord, I pray that we would be those who love to proclaim that one way. Lord, help us to live our lives in such a way, whether we are carrying the Ark of the Covenant or we're a peg carrier, that we would do that for your glory. We would be faithful. And even if we must be driven into the ground as a peg, may we hold on to that rope tightly. Finish the job you've given us to do, Lord. Lord, the body of Christ needs many members functioning as one body to bring you the most glory. Help us do that, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.